We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere. It's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way to get questions to us is through that website, through the website, tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, you can still ask me a question anywhere. Hit me up on Twitter. Hit me up on Facebook. Me, we, you, me, social, dice, I don't know, dice camp plus fora, Instagram, uh, Pinterest. I don't know. Can you ask people things on Pinterest? Is that even part of that platform? This week, we have a question from patron Roger Malosh about power creep, but not the Magic the Gathering kind. He asks, hey, Mo and Sean, I've enjoyed every one of your podcasts and look forward to a new one each week. I have a question regarding power creep, not the kind you find in games, but the power creep experienced by players. <laughs> I always played cards and used to enjoy Risk many moons ago, but I have recently started to play real board games. The first modern board game I tried was Jaipur. Then, later at CG Realm, I was introduced to Carcassonne, which really opened my eyes to this new hobby. Somebody then suggested a, gr a game called Great Western Trail. Mm -hmm. I had never experienced anything like this. It was all completely new to me. I, to say I was overwhelmed would be an understatement. I managed to muddle my way through the game, but I could smell a few brain cells still, still smoldering <laughs> when we were done. I remember somebody saying the game was easy before we played it, and I'm sure they really thought it was. But I wouldn't call it a gateway game. Of course, now that I've played many different games, I would take a game like Great Western Trail in stride and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. This brings me to my first question. How do you determine if a given player's skill and experience is a good match for a new game they are about to play, given that a player's skill level is very subjective at best? As far as power creep goes, as my skill increases and I look for greater and greater challenges, Am I going to lose interest in most of the current games in my collection as I pursue this hobby? Is this a common occurrence? All right. So there's a lot there. I, I got to admit, first off, I love this question. I, lo I love the detail that Robert Roger gave. I like that it's not just a bang quick. What do we do for this? I like it. I like having these longer free freeform questions. Uh, but before diving into the actual questions, I just want to talk about this whole phenomenon. Uh, like he's calling it power creep. I don't know. That's not the term I'd use, though. I don't know. Experience creep or player skill level seems to fit a little better. It's not, it's not the term. Power creep to me makes me think that whenever a new expansion comes out, it's got better versions of things than the original that makes the stuff in the original no longer worth using right like that's what i think of when i think of power well, creeping I think games. I, it kind of makes sense in some ways because when uh when you play a new game that's your expansion right you're expanding and your power level is expanding okay is, is i think how he's thinking of it and, and in that frame it does make a little sense it's your power that's creeping up Fair enough. That works. That works. Your, your power, your experience, it, your comfort level. It's it's actually, I think, board game comfort level is almost, comfort level creep doesn't fit, though. So, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> uh, familiarity, board game familiar, familiarity yeah. rating with different games and mechanics, possibly. But anyway, this is definitely a thing. This is, this is something that is a huge part of the board game industry, I have to assume, always has been and probably always will be because it, it is something you definitely experience. Like, when you first experience your first hobby board game right like your first game that's more than just a roll and move where there's actual decision points to be made you may be managing resources you may have multiple actions to choose from whatever whatever that first game you're getting introduced to is is gonna like blow your mind right and it's gonna seem so complicated compared to one of your, like the basic mass market games Whereas like Monopoly being on the hard end, like there are people who consider Mop Monopoly a difficult game and a hard to learn game. I, I personally don't see it that way, but I played lots of games and I get it that someone who's used to playing one type of game will find another, another definitely more difficult or easier. And this is definitely also even, even card games. So that's why I think this has probably been with board gaming all the time. Like even to this day, I am too intimidated to try to learn to play bridge. I have no interest in learning to play bridge. And when I was first learning to play cards, Crazy Eights was pretty simple, but Hearts seemed really complicated and confusing. Sure enough, eventually after losing Hearts, while Spades seemed a lot easier and so on. So I think this is just a common occurrence for anyone who plays any amount of board games who is constantly trying new things. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's, there's definitely a, a more difficult things become easier. Uh, but he, his concern in that second part of his question is whether or not he's going to lose interest in older games and that's where i think it gets uh it gets interesting 
uh, because there's a little of that, but uh, we'll talk about that a little later. Yeah, so the, the main thing, I, I just want to talk about the general phenomena. I'll get to his questions. We got, he, he's basically got two questions here. We'll deep dive the questions in a bit. Before we get there, I just want to talk about a couple things. So one of them is weight, right? So one of the things, we have an entire episode on this where we talk about this, but game weight or game complexity, game weight is, a, is something that uh, hobby gamers talk about all the time. I don't know who coined the term game weight or where it started, but games are rated on a weight scale, and we're going to point towards Board Game Geek here which is, of course, the world's biggest depository of board game information all in one place on the web. And somewhere anyone listening to us, I'm sure, is well familiar with. But if you never heard of Board Game Geek, it's, it's a little intimidating to check out for the first time, but worth going to. We got an episode on that, too. But anyway, Board Game Geek has a weight scale from one to five for every board game ever published, including ones that still aren't published yet. And weight is based on a number of different things from the complexity the number of decision points the um number of options presented the depth of the rules how thick the rule book is how long it takes to play like there are a ton of things now we're not i'm not going to get into all that again if you want to know about that we wrote about that on the blog that was on um, the article entitled weighing in on complexity and we talked about this way back in episode 38 of our podcast called a heavy topic which we'll throw links to both of those both in the show notes and in the chat room if we get a chance so game weight is subjective always will be because when I play a game for the first time, I am going to base how, well, I'm not base, but the game's going to feel as difficult to me based on my previous experience from other games. So if I played lots of games that are similar to it with similar mechanics, the game's going to seem easy because I've already learned that stuff in my past. I've learned it in other games. Whereas if I'm playing a game with all kinds of new stuff that I've never seen before, it's going to seem heavy and complicated and brain burning, even though it might not be weighted higher, right? So where weight actually becomes useful to me is in comparing them. So what you need to do here is to pick a game you you personally think is at a certain level. So the example Sean and I have used multiple times on the podcast before is that Race for the Galaxy is a 2.5 on Board Game Geek. So to us, Race for the Galaxy is the perfect middleweight game. So whenever I'm comparing games and people go, is that a heavy game or a lighter game? I look at Race for the Galaxy and I think, hey, is that lighter than Race for the Galaxy or heavier than Race for the Galaxy? And if it's heavier than Race for the Galaxy, I go, yeah, it's on the heavy side. If it's a lot heavier than Race for the Galaxy, I'm like, well, it's a heavy game. <laughs> Whereas if I'm like, oh, that's so simple compared to Race for the Galaxy, right? Like that's just our benchmark. Yep. And that's what I think you need to do is find a benchmark to compare it to. Right. It, it's a lot uh, to take this out of board gaming and sort of give, give weight a, a different um, view uh, you can think about math, right? When you start off with math, you're learning addition and subtraction, multiplication and division, right? And and even those at the start are pretty difficult, but mm -hmm. once you get those, they're pretty easy. But then you move on to other topics when most of them are just different applications of multiplication and addition and subtraction, but they seem, until you understand how to apply them, a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. But then... By the time you're in grade eight, you're doing square roots and, and exponents without even thinking about them because you've learned how to apply those topics. And then you move into, you know, grade nine, grade 10, and people start throwing, you know, sums at you and, and, and all sorts of algebra and, and calculus. Mm -hmm. And it gets crazy, even though when you work through it, it's those same first principles over again, just applied in a different way. And eventually those two become a little more natural to you. And now all of a sudden trying to find the slope of a line isn't as terrifying as it was the first time someone threw it yeah. up on a board for you. Uh, and, and really that's that whole same weight scale, right? Calculus is a 5.0 and addition is a 1.0 mm -hmm. and all those steps between those is, is what makes the scale of weight in, in your math problems. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I'm sure it applies to other things like cooking. Yep. I'm sure if you look at a basic recipe compared to a complex recipe. I don't know. I don't know enough about cooking. <laughs> I'm at that basic level. You look oh, yeah. at like learning to make scrambled eggs when you were a kid the first time. Seems like, oh my God, I have to like heat the pan and I got to worry about how hot the butter is and I got to wait till it's bubbly. Like, like it seems very complicated. Whereas now like scrambled eggs is a small step as part of a bigger meal nowadays. Right. So I, I, like, I'm sure it applies to almost all things. It's just, it's, it's about comfort level and, yep. and, 
your your immersion into the games. I, and really, it, again, it's uh, to me the the number of basic principles involved uh, is is a, is a good sign, right? If you've got fifteen different mechanics in your board game, that's going to be a heavier game than mm. a roll and move. <laughs> in general, yeah, yeah. Though it is interesting that every now and then they'll come up with a, a new game that just uses one mechanic really well and right. sometimes can make that pretty heavy by just using that mechanic in different ways. Yep. But well, again, you're using that mechanic in different ways. Right. It's in that new and new and interesting uh, usage and, and, and something yeah. that's different the of, of what is technically still a basic concept just applied in a different way. So I think I think at this point everyone probably gets the gist and and yes it's normal this this is something that affects everyone as they play more games unless you keep playing the same game over and over and over again as long as you're currently exper constantly experiencing new things in gaming your gaming level of experience and your point of view is going to broaden and you're going to find learning new things easier because you're always building on that base you've you've learned the addition subtraction now you've learned the multiplication now you've learned the division and from that you can grow. So getting back to the actual questions from Roger. Now, he had two specific different questions, and we're going to talk about these separately. So first off, he asked, how do you determine if a given player's skill and experience is a good match for a new game they're about to play, given that player's skill levels are very subjective? So we've, again, where I'm going to point people back to previous episodes. I guess this is what happens when you hit your two-year anniversary. Is yep. You've already talked about parts we've, of everything We've got already. evergreen content there. We, we have evergreen content. So we talked about selecting what games to play in the past. Now, we did have a generic episode. Now, this time I'm not going to bother drinking, dropping links because I don't think it's overly pertinent to this particular topic. But we've talked about just how to pick what to play on game night. And But more specifically, the episode that I think is more interesting is we have talked about trying to pick games that will hook new players. And the both cases for trying to decide what to play is getting to know the players, whether that like interviewing them, basically asking questions, finding out what games they like and what they don't like and finding out their comfort level through knowing which games they're comfortable with. You can then use that to determine what games will be good for a, either a next step or a next play. Right. It's almost essentially a session zero uh, if, even to, you know, in, instead of trying to figure out what role, what you're going to allow and not allow in your role-playing game, you're going to figure out what mechanics they're going to be comfortable with mm -hmm. and, and where you can sort of push the limits a little bit and, 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 and dig in, you know, maybe they aren't going to feel comfortable with, uh, you know, a power, uh, mechan uh, auction, but mm -hmm. they are, you know, they like magic, so getting that deck builder influence in there is something that they are going to be feel comfortable with. And you might want to go towards Lords of Waterdeep. Yep. So speaking of Lords of Waterdeep, this is one that I, it, it kind of shocked Ian and I, and this is, this is another aspect of it. Okay. I don't know if I want to talk about this first or after Lords of Waterdeep. Let's talk about it now. So another aspect of this is just because you feel a game is heavy, doesn't mean it's going to be heavy for someone else. And because you think a game is light does not make you better than someone who finds that game difficult, right? So I would hope, and I, I actually know who taught Roger how to play Great Western Trail. I'm glad to know who, who that person wasn't being pedantic. They weren't like, well, this is an easy game. You should have got it. That is not what this topic is about. In this case, your experience level is based on the games you played. And because you played more games than someone else doesn't make you a better person or a better gamer than them. It just makes you a more experienced person or gamer than them. Yep. So I just want to get that out of the way because I'll admit Deanna and I kind of laughed at this one because the other day I shared a deal on Lords of Waterdeep and someone quote tweeted that deal going on about how it's such a great hardcore game. And I'm like, hardcore? Lords of Waterdeep. I have never seen Lords of Waterdeep called hardcore. And I'll admit I had that little snicker, which is bad on me. Really, I shouldn't. I shouldn't be making fun of someone else for having less gaming experience than I am. That's bad mo. Um, but if that player showed up to my game night, right, or to my house or the, my game night I'm hosting at the CG Realm or a local game store, there's no way... I'm going to then break out food chain magnet or Indonesia or a 18 XX game, right? Like they, they think Lords of Waterdeep's hardcore. I got to watch myself. I'm going to have to look for games that are close in weight or complexity or lighter than Lords of Deep, Lords of Waterdeep. And like, say, I don't know any off the top of my head. Maybe I'll head over to board game geek and look at the weight scale. Now Waterdeep is a 2.47. So it's easier than race for the galaxy. So I'm not going to show race for the galaxy, which immediately I know that I'm like, if they're having a hard time with Lords of Waterdeep, I am not going to throw a thousand icons at them, which is what adds the complexity. And in, in one of the main things there's a key factor of the complexity of race for the galaxy is learning the iconography to learn the game. 
so I'm going to start looking for games in the low two range, right? I'm going to look for some simpler stuff. Maybe I'm going to, I'm going to look for some, I don't know, a New York 1901 or uh, Niagara as for some just way off the top of my head games. But then instead, if this person came to me and was like, oh, Lords of Waterdeep, that game's way too simple. That, that, that's like an intro level worker placement game. Then I'm going to be like, okay, then maybe I'm going to start looking for games in the high two range. But then that gives me even more room. If they thought it was really easy, then I'm like, all right, let, let's let's grab one that's a, quite a bit heavier, but not super heavy, and say, like, hey, have you played Viticulture? Because I'm picking Viticulture here because it's also a worker placement game where you're collecting stuff to trade in later, right? So similar to Lords of Waterdeep in a way. And if they're like, oh, no, I've never tried Viticulture, then bang, here we go. We got our game. I'm going to show them Viticulture. But then if they're like, oh, Viticulture, yeah, that's a solid game. It's okay. But I like heavier games than that. Then I know. Keep going up that scale. And now I'm like, well, if they like Viticulture, maybe they'll like Vinhos because Vinhos is a Vital Lacerda masterpiece that it's going to take us four hours to play and we're going to need to, you know, take a nap when we're done, which maybe that's what they're looking for. And it's also interesting because I think there's also other ways that tweet could have been taken um, because, you know, they could be saying, oh, that's hardcore uh, because the way they play Lords of Waterdeep really might focus on the sort of take that aspects True. or hate drafting. And so the way their group plays that specific game could not make it harder, not make it not increase the weight, but make it for them more hardcore because they're a bunch of players who really like digging in on other people and not yeah. necessarily, you know, focusing on their own game as much as, as hate drafting and, 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 you know, playing that competitive nature, mm -hmm. uh, which shifts how Lords of Waterdeep can be viewed yeah. to that group in the way that they play it. And again, that's a lot of what that comes. Um, and, and again, that comes from how you know each mechanic. So, uh, you know, I feel really good playing Pulsar 2048, you know, and, and that's not an easy game. I mean, I, I don't know. I have no idea what its weight is on Board Game Geek, but I mean, you know, people, people get scared of it looking at, it, looking at the way it's, it fills out on the table. There's a lot of moving parts. You can't do anything you, you want to be able to do. But I sit down and I'm probably going to be better at, or feel more comfortable and feel better playing Pulsar 2048 than I am going to play at Catan because I don't play Catan. I was never in that, you know, we're going to play Catan all day long, every day for weeks uh, group. I missed that section of the hobby board gaming uh, revolution, essentially, because uh, I was up in Toronto not not playing games. And, and so I find Catan harder in some ways than... <laughs> The, something that's a heavier, weightier game, just because those mechanics I don't play with a lot. Yeah, where Pulsar is like a three point seven one, right? Which you know, that's up there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whereas Catan, I think, is probably a one point eight ish. Yeah, right? something like, like that. I, that's a rough guess. I didn't look up Catan, but, but that's definitely a part of it, right? Yeah. And it's all about which styles you played. Now, now another aspect of that interview, right? So instead of just asking, "Have you played?" and "Did you like?" "What did you like?" is another big aspect yeah. of it. So we, again, um, today is the episode where we talk about past episodes. You're bringing up Catan. We specifically answered the question, what do you, what games do you follow up Catan with? And we actually, I have a blog post about this where I broke it down, uh, actually looking at all the different things people could possibly like about Catan. And I don't mean that in a Catan's bad kind of way, like people shouldn't like Catan, but we're like, what do you like about Catan? Is it the trading? If you really like trading with other players, then check out Chinatown, because that's a game all about training. What if what you like about Catan is making sure you're placed on the right spot so that when you roll those dice, you get resources. Well, then you're going to like any of the dice based resource generation games like Machi Koro or Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Right. And I went through all the different different aspects of Catan that I think people why they play Catan, which for many people is going to be multiples of those and kind of took those apart and went, well, if you like this aspect of Catan, you'll like this game. And if you like this aspect of Catan, you'll like that game. And it's the same thing here. If what you like in Lords of Waterdeep is the Dungeons and Dragons theme, well, now you're going to start looking at dungeon crawling games, right? Like the D&D &D board games and Descent and possibly even as much as Gloomhaven going into if you want it like a, a difficulty scale there or maybe if they want lighter versions but dungeon crawlers you're looking at a classic like hero quest or one of the various versions thereof that have been released in the last few years same deal with if you're looking at lords of Waterdeep. what are other things they could like about it and um 
they could be the intrigue of the intrigue deck and backstabbing people. If that's the case, maybe you look into say like a dead of winter or something. So you've got that story element, which I know Sean doesn't think there's a lot of story in Lords of Waterdeep, but there is some story to Lords of Waterdeep. So you have a story, you have a story going on, uh, but you have this traitor mechanic where someone in the group is betraying, possibly betraying everyone. And everyone has a personal goal that may or may not go with the group. Right. So that's another big aspect of recommending games to players. Yeah, I think uh, immersion, uh, and again, I didn't personally feel it in Waterdeep, but I know there are people who are out there, and I think yeah. this group is probably one of those guys, or one of those groups of folk who, who get into Lords of Waterdeep. Yeah. Uh, they may be, you know, huge. If they call D- it hardcore, yes. They may be huge D&D fans, uh, you know, the, the folks who really get into the novels and, and immersion into the world of Dungeons and & Dragons, and love diving into Lords of Waterdeep mm. in that level where the take that is personal and the hidden traitor aspects and things like that are, are really kind of uh, immersive and make it that hardcore D&D board game that really sinks in for them. Yep, totally fair. So again, if you, like, uh, again, players' skill and experience is subjective. Well, their experience isn't subjective. I would say that's objective. You can ask them, what games have you played? Yep. That, that, now, what they've learned, that's their skill from that experience is definitely subjective. Yep. But, but I think asking people, what have you played? What do you like? Find a common ground. Find a game that you have in your head a difficulty level set, a, a weight scale, a complexity scale, and then say, okay, what about this? Would you like to play something heavier than that or lighter than that? Right? A, or did you find Great Western Trail easy? No? Okay, so you want something simpler than that. Did you find, how, how did you find, you know, last week I saw you played this. How, how did you think of that? What did you think about it? Was that easy to learn? Um, like, for example, at this point in time, I remember Roger being there, and we played a game of Arkwright. Now, he didn't play, and I remember him watching and him just going, no, no, not for me. And I'm like, I, I'm looking forward to the day when Roger gets to the point where he's going to come to me and say, remember that game you had? With, I want to play Arkwright now. But he's not there yet. And again, one of the things we do need to stress that because the game's heavier doesn't mean it's better, which is going to lead to our next topic. So this is the other question Roger asked. Am I going to lose interest in most of my current games in my collection as I pursue this hobby? Is that a common occurrence? And I got to say straight up, no. I Not in general, no. That's that's not something that... I Maybe someone has had that happen, but I don't know anyone who's like gone as they've leveled up gaming thrown out the old stuff now i i can see there could be instances of this um if you got into some really lighter fluffier stuff in the beginning um i you know i and i i hate to say this i feel like i i harp on this game but <laughs> chocolatiers right chocolatiers i don't think has the lasting of uh, ability and so if that was one of your games that you really got into I think after a few years, when and once you started playing some harder core games, that one might go away. It might. Um, but that has more to do with the replayability of Chocolatiers mm-hmm. than the actual difficulty of Chocolatiers. Yeah. Um, another, you know, a great example is, um, you know, the Duke, right? I can play the Duke with my son, um, and he may not be the best example because he's actually pretty good at the game and beats <laughs> me. Uh, but that's going to be a different experience than going down to Windsor and playing Mo in the Duke, right? Because of the relative experience of my opponents. Mm. The game hasn't changed, but the level of opponent has changed and, and what you need to do and what you need to put into that game is going to be different than playing with a more beginner op- op- opponent. And now if you have a partner that you're playing games with at home, you're probably both going to be growing at that same level. So that mm. same game you have in front of you is evolving with you. And, and what you put into and get out of that game change. Yeah, so I, I can see it happening for, for some people. In general, though, I haven't experienced it. Like, like, it's just not one of those things. Like, I can see how, in theory, it's, it seems like that might happen. Like, there are definitely games I no longer think of as hard or complex as I used to. But, like, nothing's that I can think of in my collection is dropped to that point of just being too simple or basic or not being fun in some way. 
Right. Now, overall, as time goes on, I have found I personally enjoy longer, heavier games more and will seek out chances to play those. And But those are something I usually do like as a special occasion. Those are things I, I we, we set an event night to play these heavy games. But that hasn't stopped me at all from still playing and enjoying simpler games from time to time. Like even just with Deanna and I, who both love heavy games, we were playing Codenames Duet the other day, and we played Great Dancing Meeple. Like you don't get much lighter than those two. Well, Patchwork's fairly complex. Or sorry, Codenames is uh, I, I don't know. There's brain burning. Great, great Dancing Meeple, which I'll be talking about later in the show, really has got to be pretty low on the weight scale. Now, one of the things though I was thinking about when when thinking about this topic that did click in though, is that part of what I enjoy about playing games and the whole hobby in general, is teaching new players and introducing players to new games, especially games I enjoyed at one point. Like, one of my favorite things is when Sean comes down and I'm like, I never can decide what to do because I'm like, man, like, he didn't play any of the classics. So, like, last time he was down, I broke out Alhambra. And, like, that's going back to, like, pre-2000s, right? And I'm like, Sean's got experience with Alhambra. And sure enough, Sean liked Alhambra. Like, it's not the best game ever made, but it's interesting to see that old-style game where it's just about drafting cards and building tiles and majority. Like, it's so distilled down compared to, say, a Pulsar with so much stuff going on. And he really enjoyed the game. And I love showing Sean that game. Or I love going to an event and, like, teaching someone like Roger Carcassonne for the first time and seeing their brain explode when they're like, wow, I don't have to – like – where were we? We were at the Canadian, the, the Windsor Comic Con. I This is one of the first times this this is something that blew my mind. And we are doing demo games. It was myself and Jeff Seuss. I was showing off Go Cuckoo for the little kids. And Jeff was showing off the Harry Potter Funkoverse game. And we had two teenagers sit down and cosplay. So we had uh, we had uh, Rogue and Cyclops, no, Rogue and Gambit sit down to, to play Harry Potter with us. And the first thing they wanted to do every round was grab the dice and roll them. Because that's what they had done in every other game they have ever played in their entire life that wasn't a card game, is you start your turn by rolling the dice, and then that tells you what you can do. And we're like, no, 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 you can choose. You have four actions. You can move, you can attack, you can do. So I don't roll the dice. And sure enough, like for three to four rounds of that game, they would reach for the dice at the start of their turn. It's your turn. Grab the dice. Like, no, no, you only touch the dice if you're attacking. So it's definitely a thing, right? And it was so neat to show these people this, this Harry Potter Funko verse game that blew their minds. Like, like they're like, it's not a circular board. You don't go clockwise. I can go where I want. Like they were blown away by these options. And I love that. I love showing people new things. So I thought about this and I'm like, maybe one of the reasons I haven't grown out of any games is that I'm still excited to share those games with new people. So there's, I don't want to get rid of Carcassonne because I might be able to share that with someone who's never played it before. Although I get to admit, even with Carcassonne, though, like sitting down with a bunch of experts playing Carcassonne was still a ton of fun. So, well, and that's that's one of the things where I feel like um, a good game that isn't solvable, and that's a key, mm. right? Because there are games where there is a best path, and and those games I can see you aging out of. Uh, yeah. But a a good hobby game doesn't have that problem. Uh, yeah. We try to avoid those games. Uh, so unless it's a one and done, like like there yeah. are games designed to do that that are yeah. solved, like puzzle games, right? Like the exit games and stuff. Like yeah, that. but uh, you know, I, if you if you if it's a, a replayable game that doesn't have a solution and isn't broken by some, you know, in some people's terms, um, you you learn new things, and as you're playing, you you start finding new things. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things, you know, Sushi Go is a great example of a really silly, simple game, but. As you're playing it, you know, the first time you play it, you're focused on your hand, right? You're just trying to figure out what the maximum points you can get with the cards Mm -hmm. that are offered to you in a draft. And that's how you start the game. And then you figure that out and you realize, oh, wait, they did that. Oh, wait, if I watch what they're drafting over there, then I can think about what else is going to be available in the deck and I can plan for that. And then there's, you know, there, there are, there are cards, levels yeah. of, of difficulty that a beginner isn't going to get and doesn't need to get to still enjoy the game. Mm-hmm. But as you evolve, you start unwrapping some of these layers of difficulty in the game and thinking further ahead or thinking, thinking about different aspects that, that could take, uh, you know, take you to a next level and, and, and just playing that much better. And you unwrap that, that depth. Uh, in the game mm-hmm. that was there all along, 
but you didn't need to worry about it when you were still a first player, new player. Yeah, this is what we're talking about when we talk about system mastery. That's what we're talking about is, is un unraveling, the, getting through the layers of the game, unraveling the onion, right? Getting to the depth of the onion in the game and, and figuring out those other levels. And going back to Chocolatiers of all things, that was one of those games that had those Eureka moments. Those, while I'm playing this game, I'm just drafting these cards to do, oh, wait, but it matters what order, oh. And then you play a little further, like, oh, but wait, it's area majority and only the person has the most scores. And you know what, if I know he's got six and I only got two, I don't even care about that because there's no way, right? And that was one of those games. So I got to admit, that one had a few Eureka moments. And then once you've had them, the game kind of distilled down to, all right, now I've discovered all the things in this game and may not be as interesting. Right. So I don't know. I, I would say overall it happens. Like you may lose interest in some of your games, but I can't see you like assuming you're curating your game collection, which I know Roger is, and you're not just buying every game that comes out on the market. If you're doing your research, good games are replayable. Good hobby board games are replayable multiple times. There's a reason I have played Terraforming Mars 50 times. There's a reason I played Bonanza, like even more than that, or even like Catan back in the day, we literally played every Saturday for like an entire year while my parents were down in Texas. We went to check on their house on the weekend and we played Catan and drank their booze. That was just the thing we did. And we had groups of up to eight people doing this with multiple tables playing Catan at once. It was like, it was our Catan year, years. And I I'd made some great friends during that time and just played tons of Catan. And but I still have a copy downstairs. I'll admit I don't play it often, but I still have it. We played it at our um, was our launch party. We broke out Catan and we played that, so that was pretty cool. And we and again though, I was introducing it to someone new. Sean had never played Catan, and Aaron, who was our webmaster, our awesome webmaster. Thanks for all the work the last few weeks. Our awesome webmaster had never played it, and we wanted to introduce her to her. And what's awesome is in the last month, I have seen Aaron on Twitter sharing pictures of playing Catan. So. And really excited about introducing it to her extended family. So that's been awesome. Excellent. So the other thing too with this is where I have seen this happen is something we talked about a couple weeks ago. Wow, well, four weeks ago. Actually, a month ago now. Wow, time flies. A month and a half ago, we talked about a topic from Yuho Rutilla, another one of our patrons, was asking about culling your collection. I was like, I'm out of room. I don't know what to do. I need to get rid of something. How do I decide what to get rid of? And we talked about something called the Jones theory, which I think Cody Jones, now I don't have it in front of me, but someone out there, a blogger or a reviewer had come up with this theory that you should only own one game in your collection for each style of game. So like if you have a deck builder, you should only own one deck builder and you shouldn't buy a new deck builder. And if you buy a new deck builder, you get rid of the one you had. Uh, while I don't totally agree with that particular aspect of it, I do think some games can replace other games in your collection. And that's where I have seen this. So an example is why would I personally play Dominion anymore now that I've discovered Clank and Tyrant of the Underdark? Now, I know there are Dominion fans out there, but Dominion, for one, at least in the first edition of the rules, has been basically solved or broken. There are people have found, they call it the big money, is, is one of the ways. And there's a couple combos that just can't be beat. Um, second, I just don't find that game that interesting because it's just deck building. There's not enough there. There's not enough things going on. Whereas Clank, I'm also delving into a dungeon and collecting loot and trying to run out of the thing and I'm on a time limit. Or Tyrants of the Underdark, I'm playing a dudes on the folk on the map board game at the same time as i'm deck building and i'm doing things like i want to use chambering from that other game what is it promoting i'm promoting my dark elves to my inner sanctum i think is what it's called or my inner circle to get them out of my deck and score points and like there's just more going on and it's more interesting to me and more fun so i have no reason i ever played dominion and enough people played dominion and dominion to me isn't a game i need to introduce anyone to i will find a simpler deck builder to introduce them to instead like possibly ascension would probably be my choice because at least you have a rotating market i i'm not a big fan of deck builders anymore with a static market i find that kind of boring i'm like i always look at the same 10 cards and it's just a puzzle of figuring out how those 10 cards work together so i totally agree with that so i like that is one of the things that that i think can make me lose interest in a game in my collection is when i find a game that does what it does better so that that is a definitely a valid thing but i don't even know if that's even based on what we're talking about tonight like if that's based on mastery or experience level or skill level or weight no it's just based on someone doing a better job at using a mechanic than someone else right yeah no absolutely and it's cody jones from the uh cody and our game on with cody and john 
is the podcast uh, where it happened. Uh, I can't even remember if I said Cody. I said a name. Yeah, it's Cody. Cody Jones from uh, Cody Jones. Game On with Game Cody on. and John uh, during episode 32, November 15th, 2009. Yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah. That's an early podcast. I don't know if Game On still on. It's not one I sub to if it is. So I don't know. I apologize, Cody. I've never listened to your show, but you sound a little pedantic anyway. So <laughs> uh, I, I find that particular theory to be a little harsher than anyone needs to be with their collection. Though I do know people who follow it. We yep. we had a, a conversation with Keith J. Davies last week on the show. Well, he wasn't on the show, but with a comment about why would you ever get rid of a game? And, and we're terrible gamers for getting rid of games. And we obviously did not do enough work before we purchased it. If If we had to get rid of a game, we made a mistake by buying it. Right. Fair enough. Yep. Uh, and yeah, and Ryan Ryan says it quite succinctly in the chat room. Heavy does not inherently equal good, nor light inherently equal bad. It's just how difficult it is, <laughs> you know, right, in, so in a number of mechanics. I, I think that's about what we've got for our, I don't know, unless you have something to add. No, no. I, I, I think we pretty much covered it. So just to, to try to recap without scrolling back in my notes. So basically, Roger is experiencing this thing where he started playing games. And was like, wow, that game's really heavy and complex and, and was scared of it. But then as he played more games, was like, oh, wow, no, now I get it. That game's not complicated at all, right? And this is normal. This is some something that's going to happen to anyone who plays games for an extended period of time who is constantly, especially anyone who's playing new games. If you are constantly exposing yourself to new games, new mechanics, this is something that's going to happen. You're going to become more familiar with the, 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 the general mechanics that are out there. Yet another previous episode, we have talks all about all kinds of game mechanics. Actually, the blog post I just updated and added a bunch of new ones. Um, as you become more familiar with different games, learning new games is going to become easier and your scale of comfort is going to adjust based on your amount of experience. And this is perfectly normal and it's something that happens. As for recommending games for players because of this, the secret is to find a common ground. Find a game that you both agree on is at a set weight and go from there. Would you like to play? You you know Lords of Waterdeep. You like Lords of Waterdeep. Would you like to play something heavier or lighter than Lords of Waterdeep? What do you like about Lords of Waterdeep? And go from there to try to find a game recommendation that fits. Uh, Board Game Geek's weight system can be useful for this. The problem is there's no great way to sort search by weight on Board Game Geek. So that kind of messes it up. There was a site out there that let you sort your whole collection by weight, but I was on it today and I couldn't get it to work. So I don't know mm. if it's something that's died. It's a, it's an, a .io site, right? So it's a free site, a free right. um, freeware site. I couldn't get it to work or else I would have draw. I would have actually, I had a whole paragraph written in the show notes about it until I couldn't get it to work for myself. So that, there, that it's not easy to search Board Game Geek for weight, but most people have a good idea, at least the games in their collection, how they, how heavy they feel they are. Yep. Uh, please note the weight is subjective. Um, because a game's heavier does not mean it's better. Because you like heavy games doesn't make you a better gamer or more of a gamer than someone who likes light games. Leave that BS at home. Um, and then as for Roger's second part of his question, will I grow sick of my light games basically like as as i evolve and as i start playing more games am i going to make it so that games in my collection are no longer fun for me to play because i've moved on that is possible it may happen to some players but i haven't personally experienced it myself uh, most hobby board games are written to be fun to be replayable and to keep that interest going for a long time even some of the most simple games like azul have way more than enough going on to keep you interested even once you've played many different games just because the game's simple doesn't make it bad you can get to the point where you love 18xx's and you still have fun playing Ticket to Ride. That's definitely a thing. All right, well, that's it for what we've got to say on Roger's question this week. Let's head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add. So, uh, Ryan's Ryan's had a few good comments in there. Uh, he's coming to my chocolatier. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't. I, I straight. I don't want to say hating, but uh, my my <laughs> chocolatier. Uh, Comments is uh, make Chocolatier a seasonal game with an edible edition to give it some staying power outside of replayability. Yeah, we've talked about that. That would make for a good one. I gotta say, overall, I thought this was a, a rather fascinating topic from Roger. It's it's something I've definitely experienced. Uh, I have to assume everyone in the lobby has probably experienced this. Like the, to me, this seems to be a universal truth of of playing games. It, it, I think it, we didn't talk about role playing games at all here today, but I think that's definitely. A thing um though i find with role players you really shift from what you like so uh it, in your first game it's going to have a huge impact 
on what you think of as heavy or not. So like I started with Marvel superheroes and I got to admit Dungeons and Dragons at first seemed unfathomable. Whereas if you started with Dungeons and Dragons, you're going to look at something like Role Master and be like, wow, that's simple enough. There's just a few more charts and a few more things to track. And you're going to look at stuff like um, Dream Park and be like, what is this piece of fluff? Like, uh, there's nothing here. There's no rules. Well, so it's de definitely a thing with role players. But what I found with role playing is I find there's like a thing where people want more and more and more and more and more and more detail and more complex. And then for some reason, they hit this point where they like hit peak complexness and either they stay there. And there are people there. I, there is a group in Windsor that has and will always play Role Master. And I have a friend that still swears by GURPS, and I think they'll always will. But then most groups seem to all of a sudden like hit this slippery slope of getting into story games and liking lighter and lighter games where the story matters. And then I found uh, a good example of this is the Misdirected Mark Play podcast and our friend Phil Vecchione, who goes down this slippery slope of story games, but then finds DCC and then starts finding that he's liking Crunch more and more. And he's like, oh, I like having all these restrictions and things that are, I have, I have rules for everything and it's not just free form and he's enjoying that again so it seems to be a roller coaster yeah for me there's a real um sort of a variety uh again i am right now drifting into story game and really enjoying a lot of what some of those systems uh bring in their simplicity and story narrative focus but i don't want to play a dungeon crawler like though with with that yeah if i'm playing a dungeon crawler I want the structure. I want, you know, I, I want a little more crunch. And so, yeah, if I'm going to do a dungeon, I'm probably going to want DCC. But if I want to play supers, I, I, part of the, the openness of something like superheroes, especially because you can't, you don't want necessarily want to have a rule for every possible superpower, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, you know, you don't want a 400 some page. Some games did that. And some games have done that. Absolutely. Uh, but that can really get in the way of, mm -hmm. of the freedom of telling a fun, campy superhero story, yep. which is a lot of what, you know, me in particular is going for in that kind of a game, right? Where you're looking for to tell that story and, and things that get in the way of that or slow down that progression. Um, and again, we're, we're, in a, we're in a time where online play is something that happens a lot. Uh, and especially if you're doing something text-based, too much crunch really gets in the way well, of, of that flow. Uh, so I, and that's where I'm drifting towards this narrative, you know, mm -hmm. limit the roles, limit the rules and just get that story out there. Even though I like the crunch mm -hmm. of the heavy. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. I, the poly gamers thing applies. <laughs> I, it depends what kind of a story I want to play. And I, yeah. I will enjoy both. I like, fourth ed D, and i freely admit that i love that system but it was very much a board game feeling tactical move guys on the map maximize your turns resource management kind of game versus a tell a heroic tale you're still telling a heroic tale but it was yep. very much about the we beat the dragon because i went here and this guy used this power that caused me to flank and then the wizard did this thing where everything swirled around right whereas the story you told versus the bard story of finding the weak chink and firing the arrow at the right spot yeah right it was it was very different style of play and I, again i think both are valid and i've had fun doing both absolutely they absolutely both have their place in a game and it, it all depends on what everyone wants and is, is trying to get out of that game all right so this is your chance Lob lobby you obviously like you have to admit you went through this right like i i don't think it, this is a strange phenomenon <laughs> that has only affected roger and myself so i i would like to hear some exp examples if you can of games that you used to think were heavy and aren't or anything else you'd add to this conversation. And in the meantime, I'm going to go back through the chat. While we were talking, we had a couple people going back and forth. So one of the things to note was that uh, Race for the Galaxy's weight has something to do with how intrusive the iconography is, or intuitive, sorry, the yeah. iconography and is. And I think you touched on that a little bit there. I, I did mention that a bit, but yeah, that's, that's a big part of it. The other aspect, though, is the blind choice of actions. So here's an example of uh, Puerto Rico being, or San Juan being a better example. So you have, you have Puerto Rico, a fairly heavy game that they created an easier game, a card game version called San Juan. Race for the Galaxy is derived from San Juan. In San Juan, you are choosing your actions from a pace-up pile of here are the different roles you can choose which is a level of complexity. Like that's multiple choices. That's not just every turn you do the same thing. But then when you get to race for the galaxy, that choice becomes blind and people can choose the same thing. And 
Race to the Galaxy has one of those eureka moments. And this is part of what makes the game hard is to really play Race for the Galaxy well, you have to predict what roles your opponents will use and take advantage of that. If you chose Settle and everyone else in the group also chose Settle, you probably failed. You should have chose something else and taken advantage of them choosing Settle. Or if you choose, now you do get a bonus for being the one that chose Settle, you get a card. But unless, like, same thing, if you're going to develop, unless you really need that one discount, you want someone else to develop while you're doing something else so you can get that development done. And that's the level that puts it above San Juan. That's why the difficulty of Race for the Galaxy, I would say, is a medium game and not like a medium light. Right. Because it's that extra level. It's not just learning the icons. It's also learning how to play your opponents. And that's the one reason that any time anyone says that uh, Race for the Galaxy is multiplayer solitaire, I want to slap them. Because I'm like, the, the whole way to win that is to read your opponents and figure out. And not necessarily like read their faces like social deduction, but like look at what they have in play and go, look, he's got five resources on the board. He's probably going to sell next turn. So I want to make sure I hit that times two so I can take advantage of the sell. Or look, that guy with all the planets hasn't produced in a long time. So I don't have to produce. I can be busy developing while he bothers wasting his turn to produce and so on so i think that that's a big level of it there yeah no absolutely uh ryan points out that compared to lords of water deep D 5 ed is pretty hardcore oh yeah <laughs> definitely is that is a much there's a big step that's a big jump um i don't this i don't know if board game geek has or rpg geek has weight ratings for rpgs and i'd wonder where Dungeons and dragons is on that scale I would say fifth ed is way lighter than fourth, but then there were so many things that were put out to mitigate the weight of fourth, like stuff like cards to be able to track your powers that made things a lot easier because it limited how much information was presented to the player at one time. So yeah, Ryan, when it comes to what I consider challenging, it comes down to the information and decision management. The more of either there are for me with my blindness, the more difficult I'm going to find a game to play. After that, the strength of the marriage of theme with mechanics will determine my willingness to push through it with success of plays or not. So that's an interesting one. We've, I get accused of this all the time on the show, and he's right. Anyone who's accused me of it is I don't, we don't talk about theme enough on this show because I, I, like, I like theme. I prefer my games to have theme. I think theme matters, but what catches my attention is always the mechanics. So for some players, theme is definitely more important, and theme could be the thing that lets you push through that difficulty level of system mastery yeah well and i think that's part of why i feel like pulsar clicked with me was yeah, the theme the well theme themed. clicked with me better than um some others have so i, I enjoy the sci-fi stuff so so another one ryan mentions is the games that facilitate a meta game can end up being more hardcore experiences if you have players willing to learn that meta aspect now i don't do a lot of games that do that have meta but that is a huge part of why people are still playing Magic the Gathering. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps people interested is that metagame. And that goes for almost any game where they keep putting out exam expansions. Of course, then there's that whole power creep, which is the other side of this topic, which is something maybe we'll talk about another time. But, and again, the, that, also, that also gets into why people like Werewolf. And, and we don't, but, you know, there is that sort of immersion uh, and, and, and meta aspect of, you know, of, of some of those games. Um, and for, to be honest, you part of the reason why you like um, uh, Night, Knights of the Round Table, um, uh, Shadows of Camelot, Shadows of Camelot, um, is is for that that mm. meta game aspect and and yeah, that that role playing aspect in the game. Um, of course, it's also part of the reason why you don't you're, you have had problems with things like Battlestar Galactica. But yeah, that's that's <laughs> people taking it to not understanding yeah. Yeah, yeah. aspects of the game. That would be the perfect game if you could get people to, everyone played it, grokked it. I would yeah. love that game. It would be my number one game. It was for a while until I had a couple bad experiences. You almost need to teach people who've never seen the show, who don't know anything That's about it. That's how I learned the game. To be like honest, I, Alex Belden, who, hey, Alex, if you happen to listen to the show, used to live in Windsor, moved away, a, a local gamer I actually really enjoy playing with, at the Knights of Columbus on Walker Road is the one that taught me to play Battlestar Galactica. And I would have never touched it, but he's like, this is the best game I ever played. You got to play it. And I'm like, I have never seen the show. Like I saw the old one yeah. like uh, with Vipers. And, well, it's still the same character. So I can't even say it. The <laughs> 1970s version. And I loved it as a kid. I even still have some action figures. I still have my Daggett and I still have a Starbuck. But um, I loved it. But I'm like, I had no idea what was going on. And I think I was better for that. Right. And I got to admit, the theme of the game seems so cool. That's what got me to go get the complete series of the DVDs and watch it. 
which I got it. I'm sure like everyone in the world, that show was awesome at the beginning and went places that I don't know. Yeah. And thankfully I didn't, the game didn't go on far <laughs> enough to get to the silly part. Right. It's still uh, solid. Ryan mentions there's a group of uh, TI4 players so deep into the meta that they're playing the game at an ascended level due to the weight of their TI4 experience. <laughs> I bet you it's true though. Like, if you play the game enough to know all the different races that the game would be completely different than non-experienced gamers playing. The same thing is going to happen with any of those big 4X games or any of the game. Terra Mystica is an example. Until you have played hundreds, like, I don't know, 20s, 30s of games of Terra Mystica, you are not taking into account what the other races can do. No. Like, they're just there. They're on the board. They're doing their own thing. But I'm sure you hit that level where you're like, I'm playing against Swarmlings, which means they're going to be putting out a lot more trading posts than anyone else. And I'm going to have to make sure I don't build next to them so that they don't get to do that for free. You know, like, yeah. like I'm sure that level exists. And I played over 40 games of that game, and I'm not there. Yep. I will note that certain ones, witches, I know when I'm playing against witches, they're going to pop up stupid cities all over the greens and trying to make sure I take greens or make sure I, they, that yep. I break them up so they can't connect them. So yep. witches is one of the ones I can do that with. Um, Frost giant or giants are another one. I know they always spend two, two shovels, and they always start with one spot on the board. So if you can surround that one spot, they're pretty much screwed. But other than that, that's two out of 18 races that I have like a, a strategy yep. for. Yep. But I'm, I'm sure there's people out there that have played every race. Like, at this point, I've now, I think I've now officially played every race once. But that's it. Like, I'm not at that <laughs> level where I yep. adjust my gameplay based on the other player's races. I adjust my gameplay based on the race I'm playing, and that's about it. Right. I'm still working on the adjusting on my own race, so. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, Clans of Caledonia. I'm still, I'm like, no, I'm, I am not adjusting enough for what other players can do. I totally miss. I think it's part of the presentation of that game that you have to scroll down to see it. Right. And I totally forget what you guys can even do, except I just look at where I am <laughs> on the board and worry about my own. Yeah. I feel, see, I feel like I'm actually getting better, faster at Clans of Caledonia than I am at Terra Mystica, although I think we might have been playing it a little more, too. So Yeah, well, there's less to take into consideration, too. Again, I, I, I'm not a fan of comparing those two games, <laughs> despite having some similarities. All right, well, finally... All right. Finally, that's it. I think at this point, the chat's a little quieter tonight. I don't know, it's a slow night compared to the last couple months, weeks. And, and no, why we didn't have technical difficulties today. There so we go. We, we got to make sure we didn't get people coming up. Finally, if you've got a game or game night question for us, remember, you just have to head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me directly at questions at tabletopbellhop.com.